What's going on guys? Alex here. And first off, I don't like clickbait titles, okay? And as we're going through this video, if you can make the case that there's a different word that I can use, a better word to describe the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, then let me know down in the comments below because I'll change the subject of the video if that's the case. But ultimately, let's understand what I'm talking about today. The CARES Act that was put forth by Congress essentially establishes relief for small businesses. That was the idea. Let's get money into the system for all these small businesses that are struggling because of the coronavirus situation. They are some on some of them are in mandatory lockdowns. They can't have customers. Others are losing business just because people aren't spending money. And this bill was put out there as a way of helping those businesses and saying, hey, you know, we're going to help you get back on track. We're going to help bridge some of these gaps that are forming in terms of your business, your revenue, your cash flow. And it was a ray of hope in all this insanity because business owners saw this as a way to continue on with whatever business they're doing and not have to make very difficult decisions that they would have to make if these programs were not in place. And the idea was good. The intentions seemed to be good. And it did create some excitement because there was a feeling in the small business community that, hey, you know, uh, there's going to be help coming in pretty soon. This is not going to be as difficult as it is at the moment. So the big issue is how this is actually playing out. What's going on right now? Are business owners actually getting the money? Has anybody seen any cash whatsoever? Are people getting approved? What do the applications look like? All those details are changing so rapidly that if I made a video about this yesterday, which I believe I did, time's flying these days in busy season, the information would already be outdated because there are new developments, there are new changes. There was a guidance put out in the middle of the night that changed the interest rate on some of these loans from half a percent to a percent, changed the payment terms from 10 years to two years. So there's all sorts of movement going on with regard to how this is all playing out. And it's getting uglier by the day. I'm just going to say it that way. If you could recharacterize it in a different fashion after you've watched all of this, good luck. So what am I talking about? Now, I made a two-hour video going through the provisions of the CARES Act. The main two programs are the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And within there, there was a grant of up to $10,000 that business owners could possibly get. Important words, up to, not necessarily 10000 but these two are essentially linked. And then you have this other part of the bill, which was the Paycheck Protection Program, Paycheck Protection Loans, whatever you want to call it, they're synonymous. And that's sort of the other aspect of this. Now you could see that in terms of the amount appropriated, it's $10 billion for the EIDL side. That's Economic Injury Disaster Loans. And that includes that up to $10,000 grant, just $10 billion. As compared to the Paycheck Protection Program, which was appropriated up to $349 billion per the bill. So you could see in terms of magnitude where a lot of the money is really focused. It's really on the paycheck protection side more so than the economic injury disaster loan or EIDL side. And businesses got excited about this because, as you could see, you can borrow under the Paycheck Protection Program the lesser of $10 million or 2.5 times average monthly payroll costs including wages for employees making under 100000 Now, it gets more detailed than that. I'm not really going to spend time going over the different provisions. You can watch the other video to learn more about exactly how this is structured and what those provisions are. But that's important to keep that in mind as we go through this. So the question now becomes, how is this actually playing out in the field? Are people getting the money? How are the, application, how the, how are the applications being processed? And is this program working, so to speak? Because businesses need cash now. They don't need cash nine months from now or 12 months from now or some undetermined time, who knows when. They need it at this moment because business owners are making very difficult decisions and this is not a time to play around. So you might say to yourself, look, I heard about these programs 
and I'm a small business owner, so let's go and apply for some some relief. We got EIDL, we got PPP. Let's put some applications out there, and should be good. Now the EIDL side, it's important to note that is done through the SBA website. So you apply for that directly. So method of application, SBA website. You don't have to deal with banks if you're talking about the EIDL side of the legislation. On the other hand, for the Paycheck Protection Program, you do have to go through SBA approved lenders. So we're talking about banks, all right? There's no way to get a PPP loan without going through a bank. So if that's what you wanna do, you have to deal with the financial institution. They're gonna be essentially the middleman and they are there to process the application and get it going. Now, you might say, okay, I know of banks. I'm uh, familiar with all sorts of banks. Let's go to Bank of America and let's apply for PPP. That's again, Paycheck Protection Program. You'll be greeted with this wonderful message. We're here for our small business clients. Mm. Anyway, the important part, it says to be eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program, program, you must have a small business lending and small business checking relationship. That's and you have to have both with Bank of America as of February 15th, 2020, or a small business checking account open no later than February 15, 2020, and do not have a business credit or borrowing relationship with another bank. Where did that come from? Because it's nowhere in the bill that I could see. We worked through the bill. And the fact that you need to have certain accounts at certain banks, this, that, and the other thing, I didn't see any provisions in that regard. Now, there could be some on the SBA side, because as we talked about, the CARES Act links to the Small Business Act in many ways. But it seems shocking, quite frankly, that now banks are imposing limits on who can and can apply for this Paycheck Protection Program because they're holding $349 billion hostage if that's the case. So let's review again. With Bank of America, to be eligible, you must have a small business lending and a small business checking relationship with Bank of America as of February 15, 2020. You gotta have both. So if you just have a small business loan or you just had a small business checking account, that's not enough. You gotta have both. Because it says and. Or a small business checking account open no later than February 15, 2020 and do not have a business credit or borrowing relationship with another bank. What does that mean? Do they specify? Okay, so they use this language of borrowing relationship. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is maybe some clarity. A client's pre-existing lending relationship with us may include small business, commercial or corporate credit cards, conventional business loan or lease, business lines of credit, business auto loans, practice solutions loans, trade and asset-based loans. That's what they're talking about, the relationship you have to have with Bank of America. But what I don't understand is what they mean by business credit or borrowing relationship with another bank. Because they say a client's pre-existing lending relationship with us may include the following. But what about with the other bank? So if you have a credit card with a $300 limit at some other bank, does that preclude you then from applying for PPP through Bank of America? And even to think about doing that, you would have to have a small business checking account open no later than February 15, 2020. Clearly, this very much limits who can apply through Bank of America. But you might say, ah, Bank of America, who cares? Let's go to a different bank. Let's check it out. Let's talk about Wells Fargo. I've always thought of Wells Fargo to be kind of a disgusting financial institution to begin with. But aside from that, here's their Twitter page. This is as of 4-6-2020. It is 2 in the morning. But hey, you know, I need to get this information out there because I'm getting a ton of questions and I want to give you the most current info. Wells Fargo on Twitter says, due to strong demand in the Paycheck Protection Program, we reached lending capacity and closed the intake form. We are lending to nonprofits and small businesses with less than 50 employees and will support nonprofits focused on helping other small businesses. 
focused helping other there's a typo in there they didn't even bother correcting this so wells fargo it says here has reached lending capacity and closed the intake form so bank of america has all sorts of stipulations as far as who can and can't apply wells fargo isn't going to help you either intake form is closed I don't know any other way to interpret that. Okay, you might say, well, that's two big banks. There's a lot of banks. Okay, let's check out Chase. You go to the Chase website for this, and you're greeted with this message, that they're making essential updates, blah, blah, blah. But let's take a look at the requirements. You'll need to meet this criteria, and this is for PPP. Again, we're talking about Paycheck Protection Program. You have an existing Chase business account that's been active since February 15, 2020. Let's see here if there's any other provisions that are limiting. Okay, so it looks like Chase is looking for an existing Chase bank account that's been active since February 15, 2020. At this point, this is rapidly changing, but I don't see that Chase has a requirement beyond that. Now, the question is, if you didn't have an account with Chase, where does that leave you? Not in a good place so far, but... If you have an existing business account, at least it looks like Chase's requirements are not as onerous as they are with some of these other banks. I mean, Wells Fargo is completely out of the question. Bank of America has very weird limitations, but Chase is lo looks to be least limiting in their requirements. And at least their application is still open, so I guess give them credit there. Now, I applied for this for my business. Partly to see what kind of funds are available, partly to understand the process so I can tell my business owner clients kind of how things are laid out. And what I got was this wonderful email that says, Dear business client, we received your SBA Paycheck Protection Program inquiry and know that you need this funding urgently. We appreciate your patience as our technology teams and our bankers work to help you access the funds as quickly as possible. You will receive either an email asking you to go online and complete your application or a call to complete your application over the phone. Our branch and team call centers can't answer any questions about the program or the status of your loan. Again, we know how important this funding may be for you and your small business. So in technical terms, from a financial perspective, bupkis is what you get from Chase Business even if you've had the business checking account and you know we're on April 6th and still nothing, not even a way to complete the application. So that's what you get from Chase, even being a customer. Now you might say, okay, well, those are the big three. They have a lot of customers. Maybe they're not the ideal place to go for these types of loans. Let's try U.S. Bank. Now, ordinarily, U.S. Bank doesn't register in my psyche as a financial institution. Not ripping on them. I'm just saying that uh, they don't come to mind. But through Reddit, somebody mentioned that U.S. Bank gave them a response. They said that the current bank, currently U.S. Bank, and take this with a grain of salt. Anything on Reddit, we need to make sure that we definitely fact check. But it says that my bank is currently not doing PPP loans. And I filled out the U.S. Bank contact sheet on April 1st and just now got a response. It says, we're building the process to accept applications from non-U.S. Bank customers who have businesses in states where we have branches. Again, more requirements. Non-customers will require additional manual verification steps that will add time to the process. We expect to have more information and requirements early next week. And it says here that this person got an update. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, it says here, thank you for your submission. And this is from U.S. Bank, apparently. This is the response that they supposedly received. I have no reason to not believe it. Thank you for your submission to the Paycheck Protection Program through U.S. Bank for blank. We have received the initial information for your application. You are now entering step two, application review. What are the next steps? It says our current PPP process has seven steps. These steps may change over the next few days as we receive additional guidance from the SBA. So... What they're saying here is initial application, then there's application review, document submission, payroll review, submission to SBA, e-signing, dispersal. Who knows how long this is going to take? And it says on the bottom here, we do not have, let me make sure you can see this. 
we do not have an estimated funding date for applications received so far. Now, this is all well and cute that these emails are going out, but for business owners, cash is burning right now. Customers are not coming in right now. Payroll is increasing right now. So a lot of this doesn't do much good. And from the perspective of small businesses, this whole thing may have thrown a whole monkey wrench that makes the situation a lot worse than it would have been if they just didn't have this at all. Because if you are in a bad situation and you're expecting a lifeline, you're expecting help, then you would plan differently, right? But if you then never heard about that help in the first place, then you would plan as if that would never happen. So I wonder how many businesses are now in a tougher spot being that they anticipated funds to be processed in an expedient manner. Now they're realizing that not only that they haven't seen these funds, but it may take a lot longer than they anticipated to get through the process. So even more so on the small business subreddit, we see experiences from, from business owners. One of them is asking about the experience with EIDL, the other side of things, the economic injury disaster loans. And here's the response on that. First of all, this person says, I'm a reporter working on a story about the SBA and the EIDL in its advance. I'm interested in small businesses' experience trying to apply for the loan and whether or not they've received the advance. To be clear, the advance is this up to $10,000 amount, which was supposed to have been provided within three days of the application. And you're like, ah, that doesn't sound realistic. Let's go back to the bill. Okay, so we're at the bill. This is HR 748, the CARES Act. And let's look if it says anything about three days. Now, we already went over this in my other video on this whole thing, but it says emergency grant. It says here that the amount requested by such applicant to such applicant shall be paid within three days after administrator receives an application from such applicant. And from everything that I can read, no one has seen this 10000 up to $10,000 advance. Not a single soul. So this reporter comes over and is asking about people's experiences. And one user responded that you're going to get the exact same response from every small business about EIDL. We applied and expected to receive the $10,000 EIDL grant within three days, again, up to. That time has passed. We have tried contacting the SBA. The SBA reps have given a variety of answers to people. Some have said that the EIDL grant was based on number of employees and not everyone will receive 10000 Others have said that it would take weeks to get the money to us. And other reps have contradicted those statements. Clearly, the SBA is as lost with this whole thing as everybody else is. We've tried getting in touch with members of Congress, even tried tweeting at people involved, all to no avail. We are completely in the dark. We've heard exactly nothing official from anyone. No one is talking about this in the media. No reporters asking the president or SBA what is going on with the EIDL payments. In the meantime, our businesses are in trouble. We're being told we cannot open, but we still need to pay our bills. We need to pay our employees. We have no idea if we're going to be able to do so. For many businesses, this is not a matter of days or weeks or months. Many of us are worried about tomorrow. I don't know if I could say it any more succinctly than that. So kudos to this user right here because I think they summed it up pretty well. Now, again, with the fact that the most shocking part about this, let me just touch on this, is this part right here. No one is talking about this in the media. And it didn't really strike me as being the case until I read that. I have not heard anything in the media about this program or the experiences that small business owners are having. Not a single thing. Reporters are asking thousands of questions about other things, but not one person brought this up. It's kind of shocking to me because... They usually like to dissect every single little detail. And here is a program that sums up to $359 billion of aid for small businesses. 
doesn't seem to be important enough to even mention. Now, I understand everything that's going on with the hospitals and respirators and ventilators and all that. I, I get it. It's very important. And, and money doesn't take precedence over, over life. Clearly. Clearly. But in all of this, I have not seen one news outlet really focus on this thing. There have been some articles here that say that things aren't going as smoothly as, as they can. But there's no follow-up in terms of like, okay, guys, how are we going to get this on track? It's getting me a little bit worked up because I'm all about small businesses. And this doesn't seem fair. Now, a different post on Reddit asks an interesting question. Why would we want to retain our employees through PPP when most of them get more money from unemployment? And it says here, most employees now get more money through from EDD, the Employment Development Department, thanks to to the additional $600 tacked on to weekly unemployment benefits. How are you guys dealing with this? I know it's up to us to confirm their unemployment, but how are you guys feeling about declining additional funds to your guys? This is interesting because we all always want to go back to the bill to see if that has any substance, what they just said there. And if we search for 600, we see that there is a provision here section 2104 that deals with emergency increase in unemployment compensation benefits. And specifically, it says that there's federal pandemic unemployment compensation and an additional amount of $600 is being offered under this provision. Again, not tax advice, not legal analysis. This is just what I'm reading as a lay person trying to understand this. And this is in addition to the amount that would be determined under state law. So what they're saying is we're going to bump up your unemployment benefits by an additional $600. And this is in any week. So 600 bucks a week, 2,400 bucks a month. I mean, you know, it's something. It pays some bills, certainly. Now let's go back to Reddit. So this is an extremely interesting question. And there's a, a decent response here that I think is good to digest. And this person says, honestly, now that I've had some time to calm down and read up on it, I've come to believe that the primary purpose of the PPP is to pad unemployment numbers so they don't look so bad. I think the primary purpose here is political, not to look out for small businesses' small best interests. We're already closed. It seems strange that I'm supposed to put everyone back on payroll with no work. I thought that's what unemployment was for. Also, the stipulation about only 75 percent being forgiven for payroll, 25% for other non-payroll expenses like rent and utilities. My rent and utilities are more than 25% of payroll. My main concern is if I take out this loan, put people on payroll, then have to close anyway further down the road, will I still be forgiven or hung out to try because I can't help pad unemployment numbers anymore? But I don't know anything, just sharing thoughts. Again, very astute because business owners are doing a lot of math right now in their heads as far as what they're supposed to do with their employees. They obviously want to help their business, not put their business in jeopardy, but also they don't want to throw their employees out and create issues for them on top of everything else that's going on, right? Because finding out that uh, given everything that is happening, you're also fired is not great. And it's not going to give you good vibes from that employer moving forward. But at the same time, this does bring up interesting questions. And I had to visualize this and kind of ponder this a little bit. And I ended up putting a little spreadsheet together. I want to make very clear when it comes to unemployment, firing, not firing, retaining, rehiring, all that stuff. It's a legal minefield. All right. And this is not tax advice, not legal advice. Consult with your financial professionals before taking any of this into account or acting on any of this information. I can't make that any more clear. And I have to emphasize that with six asterisks, and you'll know from my other video that reference if you watch it, that employment issues can be extremely costly in terms of liability. Be very careful with this. Again, I'm not making any recommendations. I'm just making observations here. So on this spreadsheet, I kind of tried to visualize what 2020 might look like if we take two different paths. And this has to do with this Reddit response here where they basically debate, you know, should I fire my employees, give them enhanced unemployment, 
or should I keep them on the payroll and then hope to have some of that forgiven at some point when my application's processed by who knows who? I, you know, they can't even apply at this point, a lot of these banks. And then once they apply, then there's a question of how long this is going to take, when this is going to be pushed through, and the forgiveness is yet another part of this. The first challenge is going to be to get the funds. The second challenge is going to be to get them forgiven. Because if you're just taking out a loan to pay current expenses, you're just kicking the can down the road and you're creating an additional burden for your business with so much uncertainty in the future. It's not a great spot to be in. So I put this thing together and let's just take a journey here. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions, very round numbers. So don't take anything here at face value, but just take the journey with me. Just take the thought journey. We have April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. This is all in 2020. And we have some options here, right? One option is to just keep on trucking, meaning you keep all your employees on the payroll and you keep decreasing cash because you're still paying them. Customers aren't coming in. People aren't ordering. The cash is not going into your business account and you're not sure when it might. But you're incurring that, let's say, 50000 in payroll a month. 50000 All right. And the idea is that you get the funds at some point, and at some point it's possibly forgiven. We don't know what the timing could look like for that, but you're just kind of hoping that that happens. What we do know is that these expenses are fixed. So from April to December, you're looking at total payroll of $450,000. Like very, you know, there, there's other amounts that play into it, but let's just focus on payroll for now. So now we get to the possible amount forgiven. Now this has to do with this up to $10 million or 2.5 times average monthly payroll costs for including wages for employees making under 100,000. There are nuances in how that calculation is done. It's not as simple as taking 2.5 months of payroll in April. It's not that simple. This is extremely simplified. So don't read into the numbers as much. Just Get the general idea with me, and this will make more sense. Now, we take the two and a half times of the monthly payroll. That's the possible amount that could be forgiven. All right? So let's pretend that we're just paying payroll exclusively. There are very few or no other expenses. We're looking at a net payroll cost of 325000 for the year because we take the 450 that we're paying – I'm hoping for the best. We're paying. Everybody's on payroll. And this is the two and a half months of payroll expenses. Again, it's not calculated this way. Let's just let's just go through here. And this gets you to the net payroll cost for 2020 of approximately $325,000. Now, let's look at a different scenario. Let me make this so you can see it. Now, in this scenario, there's a different situation. Now, we're talking about those enhanced Unemployment benefits that I mentioned. Let's go back to the bill for a second and see where all that comes from. So if we control F, July 31st, we see that this is within the section 2104, emergency increase in unemployment compensation benefits, that it does mention that it applies up to July 31st, 2020. So I'm not an expert at this, but what this seems to show is that these enhanced unemployment benefits, that extra $600 above the state unemployment amounts is only going to be applicable till the end of July, till July 31st, 2020. So, and that's what the individual in the Reddit thread here is referencing. Now, that changes things. Now, again, none of these are fun decisions. None of this is as simplified as I'm laying it out here, but at least it gives us a little bit of a way to conceptualize what this could look like once it plays out. Now, business owners would have to think about possibly firing their employees from April to July and allowing those employees to take advantage of those enhanced payroll, uh, enhanced unemployment benefits. And that ends at the end of July. So what you can potentially do there is rehire those employees and apply for the PPP. The PPP may 
possibly allow you to forgive up to that up to 2.5 times monthly payroll, but it has to be spent within the next eight weeks. And you know, quite possibly, you may have this 50,000 and this 50,000 forgiven if everything plays out and all the planets align, what have you. If you get the loan and you get the forgiveness. So two big assumptions there. So in October, November, December, so let's say August and September, you brought back your employees, you were paying them, and that at, at the beginning of that period, you got the loan, then 50000 50000 should be basically uh, forgiven for you. And since it's two and a half times payroll, you're looking at 125000 And then in October, this is you know October, November, December, that's when you're playing the waiting game and hoping that you can possibly get those amounts forgiven. So in this scenario, you don't have payroll costs in April, May, June, and July because you fired everyone. You have no customers. You have no business. Then in August, you hire everybody back on. You apply for the PPP. Let's say it's a smooth process. You don't have to wait months and months for it. Quite frankly, you might get some forgiveness on, on, on this payroll burden that you're dealing with. And you'll only have to cover the payroll for a portion of the year. All right. Now let's look at how this plays out. The total annual payroll cost in this scenario would be 250 as compared to 450 in this example. So the total amount forgiven, let's assume that's going to be the same as the other scenario. So we're looking at 125,000. Again, if everything plays out correctly, there's nuances to that number. You know what? Let me highlight this. Don't take this number at face value. It can vary. But the idea is that your net payroll cost for the year is going to be 125000 if this all plays out as compared to 325000 Now, the difference we're talking about is $200,000. It's no small potatoes. And there are obviously some disgusting decisions that need to be made as far as retaining, firing, hiring, and all that. Obviously, every business has to make decisions on their own. But this is creating... A conundrum because business owners are, I'm sure are saying hey you know why am I keeping everybody on payroll and then hoping to have those amounts forgiven where I could just fire everybody they're gonna get enhanced benefits at least till the end of July and then I can bring it back on get some of the payroll forgiven and save two hundred thousand dollars in this uncertain time not pleasant arithmetic, but I can guarantee you that there are businesses out there, thousands of them, that are doing this calculus in their head to try to make sense of this all and see what the most advantageous way forward would be, both for their business and their employees. Possibly if both could benefit, that's the best scenario, but it's difficult to really come up with a situation where everybody's a winner. But these are some of the ideas that are floating around, some of the considerations to take into account. Again, not legal advice. Be very careful in terms of hiring and firing because you can get into some difficult situations there. I'm sure attorneys are out there going, mm, please fire XYZ because the payout on the lawsuit is going to be mind-blowing. So watch out what you do there as a business owner. But overall, you know, you could see that the forums are buzzing about this. There's a lot of uncertainty, thousands of questions as far as how this is playing out. I mean, look at this. This is the tax pro subreddit. This is when this is where our tax us tax nerds can get together and socialize. Yes, we socialize. Okay, we don't only read taxes, but this label right here is COVID 2020 relief bill. And look at it. I mean, I don't have to really get into detail here. Every single question has to do with this bill. And similarly on the small business subreddit, I mean, if you just look, every single question, every single question has to do with this. So it creates a pretty ugly situation if Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, U.S. Bank, they're putting barriers in place and they're basically saying, and here's probably the worst part of this, is that they're saying that the clients that have borrowed money from us, they can get the relief. 
because we're protecting ourselves in this. And those clients who don't have any debt with us, they're not going to get this. Or they're going to be last in line, which I don't think was the idea of the bill initially to say, hey, banks, protect your clients that owe you money so they don't default, which can basically look and smell a lot like a bailout for the banks, which rings very familiar from back in 2008. So if they're putting business owners in a position where they have to decide between zeroing out their bank account by paying payroll and then hoping for some amounts back versus firing everybody, giving them increased unemployment benefits up until a certain point, and then figuring out what to do from there, that's a difficult position to be in. And the fact that the banks are putting all this, these hurdles in place to protect their own interests and divert the funds to their own clients who owe them money is kind of gross. And I think this is a perverse outcome based on what the intent was, what the idea was, to now here we are with these provisions. And let's not forget, this changed overnight because if you look at this PPP fact sheet, it shows here that the interest rate is 1% fixed and the term is in two years. But when I did my other video, we saw that initially the idea was that the interest rate was going to be half a percent fixed, which again, in absolute terms, not a huge difference, but it's double what was originally floated as the interest rate. And when is the loan due? In two years. That originally was floated as being 10 years. So the banks are doing their thing. They're not stupid guys. They know how to direct the funds to protect their best interests, and they are already doing it. Now, and that's what we're seeing here with all these limitations and all of these rules and stipulations. I mean, I don't know if any of this is even legal. I'm sure they had their legal counsel look over this. I'm not an attorney. I don't know. So what's the solution? All right. I laid out a lot of problems. I complained a lot. What's the way to go forward here? You're a business. You need money. What do you do? Here's the solution. Small banks. Regional banks, credit unions, get in contact with them. From what I've been reading, they are the ones that are processing a lot of these loans for non-existing clients because they want to bring on the new business. This is a great opportunity for them to take clients away from Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, and all these other banks that couldn't give a damn about you. So if you Google SBA loans and your locality, let's try for Los Angeles. I haven't tried this yet. Let's say... Okay. Let's see what we find. Now, you have SBA approved lenders for Paycheck Protection Program. Look at this. Look at this. I'm going to put this down in the chat. This is the Beverly Hills Chamber of Commerce. And maybe this could be a good resource here. I haven't seen this yet. I mean, we're doing this together. And it says here that U.S. Bank, East West Bank, Tory Pines Bank, JP Morgan, we already know, First Century. So these might be some of the bigger ones, but Pacific Western might be helping banks. Let's, let's check them out. Let's check them out. So let's give this a shot. Pacific Bank. Okay, so we know these are rough times. We're committed to helping our clients, blah, blah, blah. We'll update this page when we know more. Who is eligible? In terms of eligibility, they're talking about the provisions that were laid out in the legislation itself. So, oh, so they don't have a start yet date for when they're accepting applications. So that's a no-go. Let's see if we can find a different institution here. City National, they're kind of big, but let's just see if they're being reasonable here. Okay. So over here, they have an apply online button. But it says that the loan proceeds will be electronically deposited into your CNB business checking account. If you're not currently a CNB 
business checking customer, a branch representative will contact you upon approval of your completed application to assist you in opening a new account. Okay. All right. That's something. All right. Better than what the other banks are doing. So at least they'll help you apply. This is, oh man, CNB, I'm going to call them. Okay. But it looks like they are playing ball with this and they're in New York. I don't know if, if that matters, but certainly look, the small banks are willing to work with you. It looks like clearly, I mean, it didn't take us long to find the lender who makes you open a business checking account. I mean, that's not a big requirement. So that's what I'm saying. The smaller banks are where you're going to find the bank for your buck. By the way, it's not CMB. It's not City National Bank that came up, but it's this cnbank.com. So you may have to go smaller for this to get a bank that will work with you, but use the local guys, use the credit unions, contact them. Tomorrow's Monday. See what's out there and see if it'll be beneficial for you to speed all of this up and not have to mess around with Chase and Bank of America and all these other clowns moving all the funds to their own clients. And let's not forget this $349 billion. That's an amount that's limited, at least in the initial writing of the bill. So they may expand that amount, but that's what was appropriated initially. So it may be that it may it's first come first serve. And when the time comes around to expand that portion of the legislation, they're going to be focused on other things. So ultimately, hopefully this gives you some insight as to where these programs are at the moment, what people are going through, what they're experiencing. They're not really seeing the fun so much. They're seeing issues and roadblocks and problems and delays. What they're not seeing is cash and they need it right now. Small businesses are struggling and we could get into the debate over you know, capitalism, socialism, this, that, but none of that matters right now. It's immaterial to the conversation right now. The programs are out there. Businesses are trying to get funds and there's a big disconnect. And I think that, uh, the word disaster pretty well sums it up as I had in the title. So if you found this helpful guys, feel free to share the video, subscribe to the channel. There's definitely going to be more content coming, you know, hit like comment, all that good stuff. And if you come up with a better way to describe this, I'm all ears, guys. So uh, let me know that as well. And ultimately, I hope the situation improves. I hope it improves rapidly. And hopefully there's some resolution and some attention brought on this. It looks like the media is catching up very slowly, but it may be too slow. And I hope that's not the case. Anyway, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching.